Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's update on relapsed refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. I'm Christina, and I'll be the operator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them at any time in the Q&A box on the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program. If you're listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. And now I'm pleased to introduce Hope Avalone. Hope Avalone is the Senior Program Manager of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Hope. Thank you, and thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's update on relapsed refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma webinar. We'd like to thank our sponsors of this webinar, Abvi, AstraZeneca, Genentech, Insight, Merck, and Morphosis. But before we begin, I'd like to share some information about the Lymphoma Research Foundation. We're the nation's largest nonprofit organization that focuses specifically on lymphoma, and our mission is to eradicate lymphoma and serve those touched by the disease. All our work is led by our Scientific Advisory Board, which is a group of 45 leading lymphoma experts from around the country. And in addition to today's program, we have a variety of other programs and services available for you. One example is our LRF helpline, which serves to complement our patient education programs. The helpline has master's level trained staff who provide individualized information on all types of lymphomas, as well as information on treatment options, clinical trial navigation, and connections to resources such as financial assistance. We also offer a peer support program called the Lymphoma Support Network. Through the Lymphoma Support Network, we connect patients and caregivers with others who have been through similar experiences for emotional support. In addition, LRF has free comprehensive disease guides and fact sheets, which can be ordered or downloaded on our website, lymphoma.org. We also offer a variety of other in-person and virtual educational programming so that you can continue learning about the latest updates throughout the year. And finally, we have an award-winning mobile app called Focus on Lymphoma. The app provides helpful disease content as well as unique tools to help you better manage your lymphoma. And the app is available free of charge in the Apple App Store and in Google Play. For now, we have a wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm honored to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Cami Maddox. Dr. Maddox is a hematologist and oncologist at The Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, where she's also the Director of Infusion Services. Dr. Maddox is also a professor in the Division of Hematology, um, and she has spoken at many of our patient education programs. Uh, so we're happy to have her back with, with us for this webinar today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Maddox, for speaking at our program today, and I'll now turn the talk over to you. Thank you so much, Hope, um, and thanks uh, for having me tonight. I'm excited to discuss updates on relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell um, with everyone and some of, the, some of the progress we've seen. So the objectives for tonight's talk, well, I'll just give a little bit of an overview of relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma um, and kind of in general, how we think about treatment landscape in this setting. Um, talk about considering second in line treatment options and potentially even later options. Uh, what are the therapies available? How do we think about how do they work? How do we give them? Um, how do we think about deciding between treatments? Um, talk a little bit about updates on clinical trials in kind of a more generalized fashion um, in what's exciting moving forward and then the question and answer session. So starting with an overview of relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, but really before I start with an overview of relapsed refractory uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, let me take a step back and just kind of give a, just a little bit of statistics and epidemiology on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in general and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, so these are taken um, from the American Cancer Society's website. 
non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is one of the most common cancers in the United States, accounting for about 4% of all cancers. So it's estimated in this year, 2023, a little over 80,000 people will be diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a disease that crosses all age spectrums, so this includes adults and children. Um, about 20,000 people will die from this cancer. The chance that a man will develop is it, it, this in a diagnosis of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in his lifetime is one in 43, um, and for a woman is one in 53, but this can be impacted by different risk factors. As I mentioned, this is a disease that occurs across all age spectrums, so we see it in all agents, but really the median age at diagnosis for most of the non-Hodgkin's lymphomas um, is patients in their 60s. So we do see an increased incidence um, in older patients. Um, the incidence rates have been on the decline. So there was a rise and now they have um, been coming down and we've seen a decrease in the death rate, um, which of course uh, is good. Now looking at diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So when you really look at the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, when you look at pathologically, there is somewhere between 80 and 100 different subtypes when you divide them down. So there's a lot of different um, subtypes of lymphoma. Even more common diagnoses like diffuse large B cell lymphoma can be subdivided into different subtypes. But overall, diffuse large B cell lymphoma is the most common type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. When you look at the number of cases, it represents somewhere between um, 30% and a third of all non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so 30 to 35%. Um, it again occurs, this specifically occurs across age groups, but the average age at diagnosis is a patient in their 60s. Most of the time, diffuse large B cell lymphoma patients are gonna present with more symptomatic aggressive disease and diffuse large B cell lymphoma is one of the lymphomas that requires treatment at diagnosis. Um, this is, you know, focusing on relapsed refractory disease, but to kind of give just, you know, how does this approach initially, the initial treatment for diffuse large B cell lymphoma is chemoimmunotherapy based. Most patients are going to receive this the same chemoimmunotherapy um, with some different adjustments made. For, so for a long time, a combination of rituximab, monoclonal antibody, and CHOP chemotherapy was the frontline treatment. Um, for diffuse large B cell lymphoma in the standard treatment. Um, more recently, an antibody drug conjugate, and we'll talk about those in more detail later, but called polituzumab was studied um, in the frontline setting um, with our CHOP chemotherapy with one of the drugs removed. So the vincristine was removed and substituted with polituzumab. And that did show a benefit in progression-free survival um, at two years and three years of follow-up. So this has been approved by the FDA to use as a frontline treatment. There are some times where patients have um, comorbidities or other um, risk factors like heart disease that make us change out the drugs. So I just listed some of the other chemotherapies that might be given um, in, in, in those cases. Um, and in sometimes patients who are elderly, there'll be a dose reduction given to the treatments. Um, there are other double hint lymphomas, primary mediastinal lymphomas um, that are aggressive B cell lymphomas that are treated with a little more intensive regimen, RE POC. But really, when we look at um, these patients to all together, when they're treated with these initial therapies, we do cure somewhere between 60 and 70% of patients with that initial chemoimmunotherapy. Um, but that does leave about 30, between 30 and 40% of patients who either do not get a complete response to their initial chemotherapy or they relapse after the initial treatment. Um, and that's when we have relapsed refractory disease. So when we're approaching relapsed refractory disease, whether it's a patient who doesn't initially respond to the chemotherapy or they're later on found to have new lymphadenopathy or concerning labs and then scans that are concerning for disease, we do like to get a biopsy to confirm that. Um, although the most suspicious thing, of course, is a patient having recurrent um, lymphoma, um, there are cases where a patient can have something else, including a, a non-malignant um, condition. And before they get treated, it really we really like to get a biopsy to confirm that we know what we're dealing with. 
Um, there's also cases where patients can relapse with an indolent lymphoma instead of an aggressive lymphoma, and that's treated differently. So it's really important to get this biopsy. In addition to confirming um, that this is relapse or um, continued evidence of remaining lymphoma, we like to look at certain things on the biopsy. Now, some of these things, you know, might impact the treatment that you're choosing, although a lot of these things provide us information but don't necessarily have focused treatments at this time for those specific factors. But we look at um, the cell of origin of the lymphoma. Um, there's something called ABC and uh, GC lymphomas, and they might preferentially respond to a little bit differently to some of our treatments. Certain proteins and antigens um, that we test for like the rituximab that targets CD20 and some other therapies that target um, proteins that we'll talk about. Um, FISH studies that look for chromosomal translocation. So typically this is done at, at initial diagnosis, but may also be done at biopsy to look for things like double hit lymphomas, which is um, a less common subtype. And then um, EBER or the Epstein-Barr encoded um, virus. So I, I was asked to specifically comment on this, so I will mention um, EBB positive diffuse large B cell lymphomas. Um, so this is a subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. In all reality, the treatment of these lymphomas is approached um, like patients who have diffuse large B cell lymphoma that aren't EBB positive. But a few of the important things when we're testing and evaluating for EBB is there's a number of different lymphomas that can be associated with EBB and the EBB can make the cells be look a little bit different. So having an EBB, EBB positive lymphoma, it can be important to make sure that you're um, ensuring that you're diagnosing the right subtype. Um, so you know, that you're providing the right treatment for the patient. The other thing is when um, EBV is positive on the past specimen and there's an EBV associated lymphoma, sometimes you can detect that um, EBV, EBV levels in the blood and then it can be a marker to follow um, as patients are treated. So when you've confirmed that um, a patient has a uh, relapsed disease or their disease hasn't responded, you also want to get um, restaging scans, so PET ideally, or CT scans to see what, what where all you're dealing with, um, further lab studies, which are going to be similar to diagnosis, and then other testing that may um, be considered as another ultrasound of the heart, um, if there's any concern for needing um, an MRI of the brain, bone marrow biopsy, pulmonary function testing. Um, okay, so that kind of sets us up for looking at well, how do we treat patients um, who have relapsed or didn't respond to their treatment. So when we're considering how we approach um, the treatment of, of lymphoma once it's relapsed or not gone into a remission, we look at several different things. So one is patient factors. Um, how old is the a patient? Um, and age is just age is really a number, but kind of what goes into that is what they, um, other comorbidities or underlying conditions that they might have that might impact their risk of toxicity with certain treatments. Um, toxicities of prior treatment, so if patients have neuropathy um, from their initial chemoimmunotherapy, it may impact how you're treating their, their relapse or how you're thinking about um, the drugs that cause more neuropathy. Social situation and so, uh, support. So some of these therapies require um, caregivers to be present at certain times, uh, higher level of visits to the treating center. And so it does matter, of course, what, what makes this um, accessible for the patients. And then patient preference. Um, plays a big role. Disease factors, um, so I'll show a few tables on this, but as a patient, are they refractory so they did not respond to treatment versus they relapsed after response? Um, in the last few years, the treatment has changed here as patients who either do not respond to initial therapy or relapse in less than a year are candidates for cellular therapy, which we'll talk about as opposed to just more chemotherapy. Um, response to the treatments that um, they've had in the past. 
Um, and then, you know, disease behavior and biology, um, some of the things, the logistics of some of the treatments can take time. And so there are times that you might need to give a patient one treatment to, to try to get things under control while you're thinking about getting ready for another treatment. So this is just a treatment algorithm I put up here to kind of show like a general approach. Um, so <clears throat> this is gives some statistics, but really when we look at this, so the, one of the most important things is time from first line therapy, as I mentioned. So did patients either not respond to their initial treatment or did they relapse in a year? Because that is where we now can use chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy or CAR T cell therapy. There are two products, and I'll talk about them, that are approved in this setting and have shown to be more effective than just doing chemoimmunotherapy in a transplant. Um, this is actually the more common situation. So about 75% of relapses that occur are going to either, you know, not respond or more likely relapse in that first year. So the other side is patients who relapse after a year. This is about 20 to 25% of the time. And this tr treatment paradigm looks at, since they've had a good response and gotten into a remission for a while to a the initial chemoimmunotherapy, there's a higher likelihood that they'll respond to a different chemoimmunotherapy. And then an autologous stem cell transplant is just once a patient responds to a chemo regimen, giving them high dose chemo with stem cell rescue, which I'll talk more about as well. So then when you look at that, um, the questions become, okay, you know, who's going to be 25% of the patients are going to meet the criteria for that transplant. Only about half of them are going to be eligible because this is an aggressive procedure that can come with risk. You have to be able to collect people's stem cells. Of those patients who go on to get the transplant, about 40% um, percent to maybe 50% are going to respond, but then the others are going to relapse and require further therapy. So at each level that you break down the eligibility for these treatments, you end up um, you know, with less patients that you're curing with that treatment. And then for CAR T cell therapy, you know, about 70% of people are, again, a Three-fourths are going to meet the criteria for consideration of that. About 70% are going to be eligible for it. Um, of those that receive it, we think we care with the current data about 30 to 40% of those um, patients. For those who don't, you can see there's a whole bunch of second or third line treatment options listed, and I'll talk about those in more detail. So um, stem cell transplant, I'll touch on this first just because up until a few years ago, there was this was the standard approach for anybody who relapsed and could tolerate it. Um, it was, you know, the curative option that we had. We had CAR T cells available in third and later lines, um, but we did not have them available in the second line setting. So what really is a stem cell transplant to just step back a minute? So when we say stem cell transplant or autologous stem cell transplant, often now referred to as peripheral blood hematopoietic stem cell transplant um, because the cells are collected from the peripheral blood. Um, there are two different types of transplant. There's an autologous stem cell transplant where a patient donates their own stem cells. And there's, there's an allogeneic transplant where the cells come from a donor. In lymphoma, when we do it, it's been more common to do an auto transplant and then an allo is available in the future. Um, with CAR T cells, there is less autologous stem cell transplants being done, but you hear about the donor transplants being done in a lot um, of other diseases like leukemias. So looking at autologous stem cell transplant in relapsed refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and this data is from before the availability of CAR-T. So I showed you, um, you know, how many patients are likely to be candidates for this, but this slide is showing how many patients before we had CAR-T. So before we had CAR-T, we, you know, about 50% of patients, regardless of time or relapse, would be able, would get salvage the 
or a second chemotherapy to try to go to transplant. And then 30 to 40% of those would actually respond to that treatment and get to the transplant with 50% relapsing afterwards. So the number that respond and the number that relapse is somewhat similar, but we take this approach in less patients because more patients have the potential um, for the CAR T cell therapy. So just toxicities and side effects. So, you know, this is chemotherapy and then the transplant. So most commonly drop in blood counts, infection, need for transfusion, um, fatigue, GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, hair loss, skin rashes, um, immune reactions, neuropathy, heart and lung function have to be checked before going to a transplant to make sure that that can be tolerated. And then logistics. So the logistics of a, a transplant, you know, patients receive a second chemotherapy. It's a different treatment than was given in the in the frontline setting. So we don't repeat the same chemotherapy, even if people get into a longer remission from it. We test to ensure that patients can tolerate these treatments. So they get, again, the heart ultrasound lung function test repeat scans. Once we repeat the scans and have shown or proven that that second regimen of chemotherapy has worked and either, you know, put may, the PET scan looks like there's no residual lymphoma or there's very little, then patients, they collect their peripheral blood stem cells. So they get um, a, a big IV or a line place, they get hooked up to a machine, they collect the stem cells based on the weight. And then they um, are admitted to the hospital a few weeks later. That hospitalization is usually about three weeks. So they get six days of four different chemo drugs. That's called high dose chemotherapy. They get their stem cells back, um, which is like getting a transfusion or a bag of fluid essentially. And then they're in the hospital um, most of the time about 10 to 14 days monitoring for toxicity where their blood counts are low, they're at risk for infection, um, oftentimes end up getting transfusions and on antibiotics. Um, close follow-up for 30 days. They uh, have repeat scans to make sure things look good. And then something about autologous stem cell transplant is vaccinations are repeated. So um, childhood vaccinations um, schedule is repeated after this. So now to kind of pivot to cellular therapy, which has become a more standard approach um, in this setting. So cellular therapy is a strategy based on manipulation of immune cells to enhance um, what we call anti-tumor activity. So a patient essentially, um, you know, donates for the approved products, they donate their own immune cells. Um, they're re-engineered and this uh, um, causes a response to the tumor. So chimeric antigen receptor T cells or um, CAR T cells uh, or CAR, which um, this is often referred to, there are three different products currently approved in relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, those three products are approved after two or more prior therapies, and there are two products that are approved at first relapse. Um, Two of those products are approved at first relapse for a patient who doesn't respond to treatment or relapses within a year. The third product, or um, I'm sorry, one of those products is actually also approved for patients who are have later relapses, but are not considered candidates for autologous stem cell transplant, which is usually because of other comorbidities. So it's not it's not felt that. Um, they're going to tolerate the toxicity of more chemo in a transplant, but that they can tolerate the CAR T cell therapy. And again, that can be for a later relapse. So this is a name given to genetically modified T cells that are designed to recognize antigens or proteins on the tumor cells or the lymphoma cells. And then they're act, they, they activate and proliferate um, to to target and kill those lymphoma cells. Um, they're considered a living drug since they persist for um, periods of time. Um, and again, the lymphoma ones currently are created from a patient donates their own immune cells. Um, although I'll mention in clinical trials where the field is going with um, other approaches. So um, this is just a schematic of what happens where uh, uh, you do T cell collection. So in an autologous stem cell transplant, you're collecting peripheral 
um, you're collecting stem cells, whereas here you're collecting the T cells or the other immune cells. Um, they do the, the viral DNA expression into the cells, which leads to uh, expression of this CAR chimeric antigen receptor. And this allows the T cell to recognize the tumor cell antigen. So these um, multiply release um, cytokines activate uh, lymphoma or tumor killing. Um, and then this, again, is just kind of another schematic. Essentially, the, the process of this is, you know, a patient goes in, the cells are collected from them, they're sent off, they're re-engineered, they're modified, they're returned to the center, and then infused into the patient. So toxicities of, um, of chimeric antigen receptor T cells in general, so the they have some unique toxicity, so they're immune therapies. So these therapies, when you infuse them, essentially the, there's what a release of what's called cytokines. And there's um, something called cytokine release syndrome, or CRS, that's one of the biggest risks of um, CAR T cells. And it's what makes the kind of the stringent criteria about where they can be given and how close somebody has to be um, when they receive them and for how long they have to be there. So um, what, what is um, cytokine release or CRS? So fever um, is, you know, the most common thing that happens. Patients can have a low blood pressure. They can have um, low oxygen levels, um, myalgias, fatigue. For some patients, this can be, um, you know, less severe. And for some patients, this can be very severe. There's also neurotoxicity or what is referred to as immune effector cell associated neurological toxicity or abbreviated ICANs. And neurologic toxicity can really be, um, can present in any kind of um, neuro symptom. So most commonly what we see is patients having trouble with words, um, forgetfulness, confusion, loss of orientation. There is a risk for seizures. Um, tremor can also occur. And this is where patients who receive this um, do daily assessments where they answer the questions and write a sentence um, to monitor for this toxicity. Then, like our, a lot of our other treatments, these can also cause low blood counts, both um, acutely and some patients have prolonged lower blood counts after this treatment. That can be increased depending on, um, you know, what therapy patients have had before these treatments. Um, and then also infections, um, and there's a number of different medications that uh, patients are given to prevent different infections. So the logistics of the currently approved CAR T cell therapy. So when a patient is referred to a center that um, administers CAR T cells, they undergo an evaluation. Um, it's sent to insurance for approval. Again, two products are approved in that setting where um, it's relapsed within one year or not gone into a remission and one product for later relapses that are not candidates for um, transplant. And then um, a workup is set up similar kind of to the workup for auto transplant, make sure heart, lungs are good. Um, then the, it's the identification of collecting the cells. So set up to do that apheresis to collect the T lymphocytes. For some patients, their disease needs treatment, some sort of treatment to get them to collection. So some people have a lymphoma that's progressing more rapidly and they have to get some sort of treatment um, while the logistics of this are being worked out. For some patients, they get their cells collected in a time frame that they don't require treatment before collection, but sometimes um, depending on the, the products that's used, it can take three, four, five weeks for that to be re-engineered and sent back. So sometimes patients will need treatment in between those cells being sent off. Um, lastly, I'll just mention, you know, the cells do have to go through checks where they meet certain criteria. So if there's any concern that the cells are not um, kind of up to spec uh, for what's needed, then, you know, there can be a delay in that and a patient may need some other sort of treatment. 
once it's confirmed that those cells have been manufactured and they meet the requirements for the patient to receive them, they're, they get we get what we call lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Um, I, I didn't put a time frame on that. There's a few different regimens that can be used here. Um, most commonly is a two drug um, chemotherapy regimen, but sometimes we um, use different ones. And so that's usually given for two to three days. And the goal of that is to really wipe out the non-functioning um, lymphocytes because you want those new re-engineered ones um, to work. Then patients have a few day break and then they're admitted to the hospital um, in most cases for seven to 10 days. There um, is at least, you know, there are some centers doing one, if not more of the products as an outpatient. And then that patient might be infused as an outpatient and then come to clinic every day for an assessment. So the highest risk of that cytokine release and neurotoxicity is within that seven to 10 days after the infusion. Um, and so that's why most of the time patients are either admitted for a week or up to 10 days, or they're seen daily for a week or 10 days um, to check um, to check their labs, to monitor for fever, to monitor for changes in blood pressure and blood counts, um, and then also to do this neurological assessment um, where they, you know, ask people to name objects, write a sentence, uh, give time, date, location, um, to make sure we're not seeing anything. Those, those, um, the cytokine release and neurotoxicity are often um, treated with a combination of steroids or there's a medicine, a cytokine blocker medicine that can be given as well. Um, so beyond that, looking at the logistics, so most patients will then continue to have frequent visits for 30 to 60 days. So once they get out of the hospital or get out of their daily visits, they're often seen once a week for the first month and then every two weeks for the next month and then um, at four weeks. Um, if they have lower blood counts or there's, you know, they might even be seen a few times a week to, to monitor blood counts. They um, are required to stay within a certain distance or time of the hospital for 30 days. I, so we, um, you know, some places go by distance, probably based kind of on traffic. So, you know, 25 miles within the center, which might take a certain time um, or two hours within the center. So you have to be able to get to the treatment center in case you have any of these um, toxicities within a period so they can be given the medications to the, address them. Patients have to have a caregiver that is with them 24 hours a day for 30 days. Um, they cannot drive for eight weeks uh, and patients will carry a wallet card so you know that um, if they have a complication and they go to an emergency room or somewhere, that card can be provided so it's known that they've got the treatment, that there's these risk of the treatment and um, that can be addressed. So now just kind of to take a step back and say, how, how did we get here? So CAR T cell therapies for a while, we had three products approved for patients who either didn't respond to a second chemotherapy with the intent to go to transplant, who, who relapsed after transplant. Um, but because we know when patients respond, respond to chemo and then relapse within a year or don't respond to chemo, that they have a lower likelihood of just responding if you just give them another chemo. And the idea is we need to target this lymphoma with a different way than just chemo and more chemo. And so that led to all three of the approved CAR T cell products being studied in a tri trials where they compared patients who had um, early relapse disease to either get one of the CAR products or go to chemotherapy with transplant. And uh, uh, sometimes I think these graphs can be confusing, but essentially this is just to show when they looked at patients um, who got one of the products, the access cell product who had early relapse, um, they did show that at there was a significant benefit to giving CAR T over giving more chemo in a transplant. And when you look the the number of patients who were still doing well at that two year time frame from giving the CAR T cell was 40% compared to 16% with the transplant. So just a, a definite benefit here um, to this approach, which is why it got approved. More recently, we saw that not only, you know, was there a benefit in the disease staying in remission by a significant amount, 
but the patients who received this in the second line setting when they were candidates for this treatment actually had um, a, a, a statistically significant benefit um, in their overall survival. So this is, you know, this has been the preferred approach with this showing. Um, as I mentioned, there's a second product. So the Axis cell was the first product, Lysacel is the second product. And same thing you're looking at here, patients who got CAR T cells instead of more chemo in a transplant when they didn't respond to their initial chemo or they relapsed early, did much better um, with the CAR T cells. And then this last just graph I'll show on CAR T cells looks at um, the patients who receive CAR T cells in later line settings. So not those early relapsers um, necessarily, but just anybody who didn't get into remission with the second treatment they got or relapsed after auto or had multiple treatments trying to get them into remission, showing that we now have five over five years of follow-up um, from those initial trials. And again, it looks like we're kind of from that, if you go back to that initial um, treatment paradigm I showed, it looks like this is, you know, curing um, somewhere between 30 and 40% of patients in those settings where it was used um, even later than second line. So not um, everybody will, will be a candidate for a CAR T cell, not all, um, you know, it's not the right thing for everybody. Not everybody has access to it. Um, there are patients who get CAR T cells and still relapse. So what are the other therapies that we have out there? Um, so antibody drug conjugate. So, you know, anybody who's gotten first line therapy is gonna have received rituximab, which is an antibody to a protein on the lymphoma cells. Antibody drug conjugates are a similar idea in that they also target a protein on the lymphoma cell, but they're attached to a chemo. So it's more kind of direct delivery of chemo to the lymphoma specific cells. So there are these antibody drug conjugates. So there's one targeting CD79B, polituzumab, that's now approved in the frontline and relapse setting. There's CD19 antibody drug conjugate, lontentuximab, that's approved in the relapse setting. There are CD30 targeting antibody drug conjugates, which are not approved in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but some diffuse large B cell lymphomas express CD30. And so there is um, an antibody drug conjugate approved in T cell lymphomas and Hodgkin's that may be able to be used in those select cases. So polituzumab vidotin is the antibody drug conjugates that target CD79B. Um, this was approved in, before it was approved in the frontline treatment, which I mentioned um, has been, was a trial that was reported out and then the FDA approved it um, within the last about six months in the frontline setting. There was a trial that combined this drug with chemotherapy, um, a chemo regimen called bendamustine rituximab versus um, just giving the chemoimmunotherapy alone. And this trial showed um, that overall, a little over 60% of patients responded to this regimen when the antibody drug conjugate was added. Um, compared to 25% with just the chemo, and 40% of those achieved a complete response compared to 17% with the chemo. And then um, I, I just listed some other statistics there, but essentially it showed that by adding this antibody drug conjugate to chemo, it improved all, the, all, all levels of response. Um, they also showed that at about two years, 25% of the patients who responded to treatment had ongoing responses. So while most of these therapies um, are considered not necessarily to provide a long-term cure, it also can be said that we do have data from all these trials showing that there are patients who have gotten into a remission and maintained that remission up beyond two years. Um, and so these, these can be very effective therapies for a prolonged time in some patients. The toxicities of this treatment, so most common are low blood counts, um, infections, and then peripheral neuropathy. Um, so something to consider, you know, based on the neuropathy that patients might still have from their initial treatment. Um, logistics, this is six cycles of the, the three drug combination. If it's working, sometimes um, doctors will drop the bendamustine chemotherapy, especially if um, there's problems with tolerability and just give the rituximab and polituzumab. It's given every three weeks and it's an IV infusion and a lot of times patients get growth factor support um, to help with their blood counts. 
The next available therapy is another antibody drug conjugate. So this is called Loncantuximab tesserine or Lonca T or just Lonca. Um, so this same concept and antibody attached to a chemo, it targets a protein called CD19. The three approved CAR T cells also target CD19. So targeting that same protein on the lymphoma cell. So this was studied in a trial that included 145 patients, and this trial included um, different, different kinds of um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, including that rare subtype of double hit lymphoma that I mentioned la um, early on in the talk. In this trial, um, about half, 50% of the patients got a response to this drug, and half of those patients got a complete response, so their um, disease went away by scan. Similar to the, to the last regimen I talked about, there, um, there are patients um, at one year, so between 40 and 50% of patients who got a complete response to that treatment still were had that response at one year, and a third of patients still had it ongoing after two years. So again, a set of po a population of patients who are getting long-term responses if they get into um, a full response from this treatment. This is this has been around and approved um, a lot less than the polituzumab, so there just isn't as long of follow-up. Most common toxicities with this, low blood counts, liver function abnormalities, and then there's unique toxicities to this, including fluid retention, so patients are given steroids um, to take um, before, day of, and after um, with this drug. And then there's a unique photosensitivity or skin rash um, that you have to be careful about sun exposure, um, including even like in the car to the windows. Logistics of this, it's an IV infusion. It's at given every three weeks for a year. The first two treatments are at a higher dose, then it drops down to a lower low dose. Um, if patients are doing well after a year um, and from a toxicity and a disease response standpoint, um, then they can get it every 12 weeks for up to three years. Um, as I mentioned, the steroid pre-medications are given. So antibodies, which I usually start with antibodies before um, antibody drug conjugates, but um, you know, antibodies, again, this is like rituximab, an antibody to a protein. We know rituximab is used um, in, in chemoimmunotherapy and initial therapy, but there's also an antibody targeting CD19. So similar to the antibody drug conjugate in the CAR T cells, same target. An immunomodulating drug called lenalidomide. So this is an oral um, pill that um, is is thought to really have some direct um, effect on the lymphoma or the tumor, but also activate the immune system in the environment in which the the lymphoma um, is living. So. There's a combination treatment that looked at the CD19 antibody tafacitumab to the um, oral immune modulator pill lenalidomide, um, showing that they could work together. So not just that they could both have activity, but one could make the other drug work better. And this trial was looked at um, in a study of 80 patients who were really, um, at the time, it was before we had a lot of the other treatments and they were older patients who were not candidates um, for not for transplant, but also there was no availability of CAR T cells. Um, so in 80 patients, this had a high response rate. 60% of patients responded. Um, over 40% of them got a complete response. Um, and this, when you look at it, there's now five-year follow-up of this um, showing, you know, again, there's a fair number of patients who have maintained that response. So if they got a complete response with this drug, they're still in that response um, at five years. Toxicities of this, you know, kind of a little bit of a theme, but low blood counts, um, diarrhea, fatigue, swelling, rash, um, and blood clot. So most of these toxicities actually come from the lenalidomide. Um, and um, let me see, I think next we have logistics. So essentially this is an IV infusion and an oral pill. So it is a more intense treatment to start in that you get a weekly infusion for the first three months, and then it goes to a bi-weekly infusion up to a year of treatment. Um, 
with that infusion that you're getting this weekly or every other week, you're taking the oral pill for three weeks on and one week off. So days one through 21, you take the pill, then you take it off. After a year of therapy, if patients are tolerating it and their disease is under good control, um, they can continue just the infusion of the antibody. And you see a lot of that toxicity drop off once um, they're only on antibody um, and not pill. REMS program, um, if anybody's been on lenalidomide, um, this is um, a derivative of thalidomide, and so there's a risk of birth defects, and so it is a controlled um, program. It's called a risk mitigation strategy, so um, patients have to agree to, you know, not give access to that pill to um, other people, not become pregnant, um, and then the pill is delivered in, for every month um, for them to receive so it can be tracked. Um, the newest approval in relapse refractory lymphoma is something called bispecific antibodies. Um, these, there was one approved in late May and one approved in um, June of this year. So these are really like truly very new therapies um, when we look at approval. And bispecific antibodies, um, so they're interesting in that they are like two antibodies. They, they um, target a protein on the tumor cell. So the B cell or the lymphoma cell, the approved ones we have target CD20. So same target as like rituximab. Um, but then they also bind the T cell. So if you remember CAR T cells, we're re-engineering those T cells. Here, we're just trying to activate the T cells by engaging them um, with these bispecific antibodies. So engage those T cells, make them function to target the lymphoma cells. So there, as I mentioned, are two approved. One is called epcaridumab. This looked at um, uh, 157 patients treated with this treatment. Um, a little over 60% responded to treatment with close to 40% getting a complete response. Um, this has been, in the study, there were patients who had progressed after CAR T cells, and it was shown to be an effective therapy there as well. And then glofitimab is the second one that was approved in June. Um, very similar activity, 155 patients, um, over 50% responded, 40% with a complete response. Um, and then just showing these, these graphs that are showing essentially patients who can get a complete remission from these, they do at the current time frame seem to be holding those remissions. But these are newer agents and we don't have as long a follow-up. So toxicities, these because they activate the immune system, there's that risk of cytokine release that we talked about with the CAR T cells, although it typically tends to be um, less severe with these agents, um, you know, but it can happen in, 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 in small numbers, it can be um, more severe. Neurological toxicity, although this is much less than what, what we see with CAR T cells, then low blood counts, infections, um, low immunoglobulins. And then in a small number of patients, there can be tumor flare. So patients who have lymph nodes, when they start treatment, they might actually become more painful, um, kind of seem to be growing, develop fever, um, but then improve with time. The logistics of these are actually different based on the treatment. So epcaridumab, the first one that's approved is a subcutaneous dosing. Um, it's given weekly for two cycles, then every other week for four cycles, then monthly. Currently, it's continued as long as it's working and the, the patient is tolerating it. Um, it is recommended that um, a patient with this treatment be um, considered for admission on after um, the day 15 or the third injection because they give it in step up dosing. So you smart with smaller doses and then increase the dose to try to decrease the risk of that cytokine release. And so when the, the timing of the first dose, the, the highest dose is the highest risk of having those cytokine release side effects. And so um, they recommend, you know, more intensive monitoring during that time. Glofitimab, so the first that's given where people get a CD20 antibody, naked antibody, obinutuzumab, and that's to try to decrease the risk of the cytokine release. So they actually get that on what's considered the first day of treatment, and then they get the glofitimab by specific antibody um, two weeks in a row. And then they start with their next cycle, and that's given every three weeks for 12 cycles. 
Um, again, that's recommended for that first day of the actual bispecific antibody, which would be day eight for hospitalization and monitoring. These are a little less strict than CAR T cells and different centers are kind of approaching them differently, but there is a consideration, um, particularly during the higher risk days, you know, do people get hospitalized for monitoring? Should they stay within a certain distance or do they need to be, if they're farther away from the center that they're getting treated at, at least near a hospital that can provide that cytokine blocking medicine if they need it? Um, is there a caregiver at least identified? It's not the same strict requirements as CAR T. Um, uh, some patients are being sent home with steroids so they can take that if they have um, issues while they're getting into the, the hospital to be evaluated. Um, so that's kind of a, a whirlwind on all the treatments that have been approved over really, um, you know, the past five, six years here. I mean, it's really been um, in, in what seems like a short time that we've had all these uh, options approved um, and now available to patients. So just quick, real quick update on clinical trials. Again, I don't have um, it, like real specifics, but when you look at big picture here, so clinical trials, um, you know, these are to improve treatment options, increase survival, and improve patients' quality of life. They're designed to give patients safe, um, effective therapies. A lot of people think about clinical trials as if you don't have, you know, if there aren't standard treatments like all the ones that we just went through, but that's not true. You know, clinical trials um, are really, you know, until we cure everyone, we can always do better. So even if we're curing 80% of something in a situation, there's still, you know, improvement to be made to get to 100%. So there are options for potentially good trials, no matter what stage somebody is at and no matter what um, treatments are available to them. Sometimes it's looking at giving a standard treatment plus another um, exciting treatment. So in lymphoma, things that we're looking at, um, so CAR T cell products, they're looking at, I said the three approved one target CD19, they're looking at ones that target CD20, um, CD22, ones that what are called bi or tri-specific, so target more than one antigen at a time. Something called allogeneic CAR T cells. So this is where you actually, they're referred to as off the shelf, or they, they're cells that come from some you know, a, a donor. So essentially there isn't, it takes out that processing time where you donate your own cells, they're sent off and sent back. Um, the bispecific antibodies, so there's ones looking at targeting CD19, the two approved target CD20, there's other CD20s in development. Um, approved therapies that I've talked about, there's combination trials looking at polituzumab with the bispecific antibodies. Um, you know, effective therapies, trying to add them together to see if they're they're even better. And then just newer um, targeted therapies as well. So, I mean, it, just to kind of conclude here, there are many new options for treatment for relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, how there's no right or wrong sequence. So there's no study that says you should do this, then this, then this. And this is really dependent on patient factors, how the lymphoma is behaving and discussion with, you know, the, the physician treating um, the patient and what, what everybody um, feels is best and most desirable for the individual situation. Consideration of clinical trials, there's um, clinicaltrials.gov, the LRF is great about um, hooking patients up with centers that have trials. It's always good to look to see what's out there. Um, and then there are just so many patient resources available um, as well. And with that, I will thank you and turn it back over to Hope. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Maddox. Uh, that was an excellent breakdown, and we're just going to jump right into the questions here um, so we can get to a few of them. So to start off, our first question here is, I am a 77-year-old male with DLBCL. I received REPOC last year, and I'm in complete remission, but I relapsed in January of 2023 and received CAR-T with glofidumab trial as bridge therapy. I'm in remission now following glofidumab and continued in remission after CAR T insertion. If I relapse again, what thoughts do you have regarding treatment? I mean, so if that were to happen, um, you know, I think, so, you know, we looked at, we saw the data, complete remissions um, are, 
the obviously the best response to get because those are the patients that have the best chance um, getting those complete remissions of still maintaining those remissions, especially when they do it at one year to still be in at two years and later. I think I'm not clear if it was just it looks like maybe only a few doses of glofitimab. We don't have a lot of data on if there we don't have data on if there could be retreatment, but if there's just a small number of doses of bispecific antibody given, you know, it might be an option that that was another option. I mean, that might be option to retry that. Any of the treatments we talked about or potential, um, the, the polituzumab, the lonkentuximab, um, clinical trial. Um, again, I would say that it depended on if that relapse were to happen, um, you know, what other, what else, were there any other medical problems, any other medications, any other residual toxicities um, would also play into that. And of course, we don't know what will be, you know, approved in a year or two, just looking at the pace that all these things have been approved. Thank you so much. Um, moving into the next question here. Uh, this participant writes, I have DLBCL transformed from CLL. It was stage one on one site. Uh, Ten months ago, I completed six rounds of RCHOP and 18 radiation treatments. I had a complete response. In the inter interim, a CT scan show the cancer has not returned. I also have what has been called ill-defined soft tissue. Um, I've had and continue to have a knot in my pelvis at the location of the cancer. It doesn't hurt, but I feel it when walking. Is this scar tissue common? And how do you know if it remains ill-defined soft tissue or if the DLBCL has returned? So it is actually, so when a patient has um, lymphoma, the, the benefit of using CT and PET is that you can have residual lymph tissue or scar tissue that doesn't have active lymphoma in it. So CT is helpful for size. PET scans typically are more helpful for activity. So if you're seeing residual tissue there, is that tissue have any evidence of activity? So it's not uncommon, especially when a patient has a very large lymph node or several lymph nodes um, kind of that have growing together that you can treat the lymphoma but have some residual tissue um, there. So it is oftentimes, you know, making sure that that tissue doesn't have any uptake by PET. If it does have uptake, even scar tissue can have mild uptake. Sometimes, you know, we biopsy to make sure that it's not uh, anything else. But usually, you know, knowing it's returned, if patients develop symptoms, if that ill-defined tissue starts to grow or look differently, or if it has um, uptake on the PET. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question here is, I believe you mentioned a fish blood analysis. What does that show? Yeah, so uh, so fish is actually something um, that is done on, most of the time it's done on the actual pathology or biopsy of the lymph node. If patients have um, lymphoma in the bone marrow, if they have detectable lymph lymphoma cells in their blood, which is less common with large cell lymphoma, but can happen, then that's done. So this looks at chromosomal abnormalities and chromosomal abnormalities, not like patient chromosomal abnormalities, but chromosomal abnormalities that can be associated with different lymphoma. So different chromosomal abnormalities or translocations are associated with different lymphoma. So it can help both make a diagnosis of a different subtype of lymphoma. So the, the what's been termed double hit lymphoma or high grade B cell lymphoma with MYC um, and BCL2 translocations is a more aggressive type of large cell lymphoma that is treated with more, a more intensive um, chemo regimen most of the time. And so testing for those, again, that's something that's most often done in initial diagnosis, but might be repeated, or if it wasn't done on initial tissue, um, might be done at relapse. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to sneak in one more question here. Um, is there any new research being done on neuropathy? And do you know of any treatment for neuropathy besides B12 supplements? So there is some different... Um, <laughs> I, I will say I'm not necessarily an expert in this area, but there have been some different things looking at um, like reducing neuropathy while patients are getting treatment. So you've maybe heard of cold caps to try to preserve hair um, with certain chemotherapy. So there's been um, research looking at like if patients use cold mitts um, or even ice while they're getting treatment, does that um, reduce the risk of neuropathy? Um, as far as treatment, 
Um, you know, a lot of times if patients have pain medications directed towards that pain, like the gabapentins and lyricas can be helpful, but the actual neuropathy and, you know, healing of the nerves is, is something that is mostly just something that happens over time. And I would say there's not, um, you know, great ways to reverse that. I think for neuropathy, it's important to report it and recognize it early so that we're making dose adjustments when needed. Um, there has been some smaller things. So in addition to B12, there's been some things on acupuncture. So, um, you know, none of this has great data, but there are um, some smaller reports in patients that report that, that acupuncture has been very helpful for that. Um, massage, um, like compounded lotions. Um, but I mean, this is, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for that. Thank you, Dr. Maddox, uh, for answering our questions today. And thank you again to everyone for joining today's call. I'd also like to briefly thank our sponsors again. So thank you to AbbVie, AstraZeneca, Genentech, Insight, Merck, and Morphosis uh, for making this program possible. Please remember, if you have any additional questions, you can always reach out to the LRF helpline at 800-500-9976, and that's listed on the screen here, or you can reach out via email at helpline at lymphoma.org. Also, at the conclusion of the program, you'll be prompted to complete a program evaluation. Uh, please do take a few moments to complete this brief evaluation as we incorporate your feedback into future programming. But with that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us um, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Dr. Maddox. Thank you. Take care.